pretty simple uh, as far as the, as far as the turning part of it goes. Uh, it's enhanced a little bit by uh, some black paint on the outside and some offset turning on the outside with some uh, I just call it comets or whatever on the outside edge. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to the Utah Wood Turning Symposium last May. Uh, it's one of my favorite symposiums, and one of the things that I missed the most about not having the magazine anymore is my travel budget because I got to go to a lot of different places and I don't have that opportunity as, as much anymore. But the Utah Symposium was one of my favorite ones and this year I decided to go because um, there was a guy there from Israel by the name of Eli Abacera that uh, is, is a really good turner, he's a nice guy. I spent a week with him down in Texas um, several years ago and had a great time with him. Um, as a matter of fact, I think uh, we've got uh, Craft Supplies talked into bringing him back next year for the um, for a class after the symposium, and if anybody's interested in it, it'd be well worth your time. He's a great teacher. He's got a, a school over in Israel where he teaches wood turning, violin making, and furniture making, and uh, uh, he's just a really good guy. Down in Texas, when, when I was down there, he would start every day off. Uh, when we got to class, he would say, Shalom, peace, and by the end of the week, we had him saying, Shalom, y'all. <laughs> so... Uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. But anyway, uh, this is one of the demo pieces that he did, and I thought it was worthwhile, so I uh, decided to come home and try it out and thought that uh, it would make a good, uh, good demo for here. On the back side of this, uh, on this particular one, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this one I turned um, an OG shape on it. Uh, you can also just turn a little cove, I'll pass these around, just a little cove with a flat or a round uh, on the base here. This is the first one that I did, um, just to see if it worked, and there were some problems with it, primarily because um, I used hard maple on it. Uh, it's uh, quite hard, it splinters easily, and um, I had some curl in here that, that gave me a hard time, so I decided to go with a soft maple. And I went to Dahl Lumber uh, when they had their uh, picnic a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks back and bought a piece of curly um, soft maple that seems to work out quite well. Um, but there's another, op there's another option for um, turning the, the back side of it. This is another option that, that uh, I don't know if you can see it or not. It's got three um, uh, rings, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word. This is a, um, a piece that I turned in a class with Al Sturt that I never finished. Um, I just never had the time to, that I wanted to put into carving all that stuff out in the front. But something like this for the back side of this bowl would, would work out quite well too. So uh, you've got several options that you, can, that you can use. The piece of wood that I started out with for this one uh, is 7 inches square. I misspoke when I told Ron to, uh, for the let class. You've got 8 by 8, but that's not going to make a big deal. It's just another inch that we have to play with. I start these things out, where are we at here, um, usually on a screw chuck. You can use either a face plate or you can also start it out between centers. I happen to like a screw chuck, so I start everything out with that. Um, I drilled a quarter inch hole in there, and I drilled it about seven eighths of an inch deep because that seems to be a good start uh, to the um, hollowing out the bowl to get the arc that we need. So uh, I've got a reference point in the center there of seven eighths of an inch. Now the first thing we need to do is find the center on this. Now there's a couple ways that you can get the center here. Obviously you can mark it with a pencil and the, well, locating the center is very important because um, we're going to need that later on when we go to center it and, and take off the bottom. So the first thing I need to do is put a um, tenon on this. So I'm going to measure out about two and a quarter inches, give or take, put a mark on it and use a parting tool to go down about a quarter of an inch. That should be enough. We can always make it deeper later on if we have to. I just wanted to give a, just a quick uh, shout to uh, Doug Thompson. This is a um, quick change adapter uh, thing that he sells uh, for his tools and all you need to do is make a handle for it. What I like about it is that you can, if you're doing demos, you can have 
as many tools as you want, and you only have to drag along three handles. It comes with five eighths, half, and, and three eighths, uh, and it's a it's a really good um, uh, setup. In case if there's anybody that needs to uh, be a little bit more weight conscious with your tools, I'll pass this around. I brought some other tools with me simply because I didn't have far to travel, so I probably won't be using that unless it gets dull. So what we're going to do first is clean off all the excess material uh, around that tenon because we really don't need it. So basically all I'm going to do is just start dragging my tool backwards. I'm just using pretty much the point, just a little bit the back of the point. And what I've learned with, with doing a couple of these things is that you have to take it slow so that you don't split out the end. So all I'm doing is dragging this backwards just to waste the material. And you can go in either direction. Main thing that you've got to worry about when you're doing this is don't stick your fingers in that on those corners because you'll probably only do it once, hopefully. So far I haven't done it. Watch me do it in the demo. Because you know, whenever you're doing a demo, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So I've got that pretty much cleaned off. I see I want to go a little bit deeper with the, with the tenon. So we'll just go a little bit deeper and clean off the rest of that. Just like at home, they always fall off on the floor point first. Fortunately, with this spinning square here, it's almost like a fan, and it's not quite as hot back here as it was out there. Um, so I've got that down, and you can see that basically what I've got is just these corners cleaned off. Uh, I've only got just a little bit of minor chipping, so that's not too bad at all. So maybe we'll be all right with this one. So the first thing I've got to do when I start this is I want to put a line about halfway on that tenon. And what this is going to do is give me a, a reference point when I go to offset that. So that's important. Finding the center and that offset mark are the two uh, most important things that you, that you can't forget on this thing. Now. Up close to this shoulder that I've got here is a difficult place to sand. And what I found is that if you take a, uh, yeah, this is the parting tool that I bought. Uh, it's one of the, one that Ellie sells. And basically, I don't know if you can see it or not. Basically, what I've done is he grinds up, grinds all his tools uh, to be convex rather than concave. There we are. So he's ground his so that they're convex rather than concave. And what I've done is I've ground this thing <laughs> at an angle. I don't know if you can see it or not. I'll pass this around when I'm done with it. And what, what you can do with this thing is just get in here in the corner, start out, and just make a little arc like that. Just a slight arc. And that cleans that corner out really well. So it's just about no uh, tear out. Well, it's, of course it's going to tear out in the demo. But when I was doing this yesterday, it, uh, it, cleaned, it out, cleaned it out so well that I didn't even hardly have to sand that. Must be some curl in that corner. But anyway, it works good normally. There, that's not too bad. Just had to get rid of some of the fuzz. But this thing works really well. All right, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make a mark about right here, and that's going to be the uh, start of my cove where I'm going to take the corner away. The other thing that I found is that I want to make a mark about a half inch from the top and basically I want to get rid of this section right here on that line. I want to connect this circle that I've got here with this line uh, with a cove. Now if you want to put an OG in there you can do that. If you want to do what I did on that bigger bowl uh, you can do that too but um, this is the easiest 
easiest to do in a demo, so that's what we're going to do. So basically all I'm going to do is just start making a part. What I'm doing is I'm just picking, picking out my hip, keeping my arms and my hands fairly steady. As I said earlier, what's important is that you don't get too aggressive because that's where it'll start tearing out those corners. Something like cherry or soft maple or something like that would work on this as well. Hard maples tend to tear a little bit and I would imagine something like oak or ash or something like that that has an um, open grain on it would be a little um, splintery as well. It's brittle to start with. So we're almost down there, so I'm going to start working back here towards my line and kind of blending it all together. I have no idea. Fast enough. Uh, this one looks like 1200 I guess somewhere around in there I don't know it, uh, like Jimmy Clues says turn it up so you're a little bit frightened and then turn it down so what we want is a cove out of this got to step back periodically and see where you're at. And it looks like we're not going to splinter too bad. hot there. So that's not too bad. That's basically where we want to be at this point. Now, sanding this can be kind of a bear and uh, what I found is that there's a couple ways that you can eliminate that. One is by using a negative rake scraper uh, this is an inch and a half scraper that I ground into a negative rake. Uh, when I was using this yesterday on a, another piece that didn't make it, uh, I found that the negative rake scraper didn't do that good of a job on it. It did tend to tear it a little bit, uh, but that's one, that, one option. The other option is to make a scraper with a little rounded edge on it. This works fairly well. Basically what you do is you just start here like this, you turn it up on edge, start here like this and just kind of tickle that edge and you can see the nice fine shavings that I'm getting out of that with the with the tool and you can see how how clean that's cutting on that uh, there's not a whole lot of sanding to do on that even on the uh, even on the end grain but so this thing works fairly well uh, to sharpen this uh, this is just a diamond stone and basically what to sharpen this you just take off the old burr like this and then you take the heavy stone and raise another one so that you've got a burr on it and that seems to work fairly well so that's another option the one that seems to work the best is another one of Ellie's tools uh, again it's ground convex and what he's done is he's ground a, <coughs> a flat uh, at an angle across the edge so that you've got a, um, uh, a radius and when we're done with this I'll pass this one around. This works fairly well. Um, it's used the same way, you just take and tip it up on its edge and it also makes nice light plane shavings and you can see what a 
what a really nice job it does on this. There's virtually no tear out on that. There's some lines in there, but the lines come out real quick. A little bit of um, chip out there, but nothing serious. So it worked out pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to round over this edge here, this corner. And I'm going to make a little mark in that. We should have brought a smaller skew. And you can get quite aggressive with this tool here. I'm right in this, right in that area, right in through here, just a little bit, a little bit uh, above the corner. Not right in the corner, but just a little bit above it. So anyway, um, let's take that down a little bit more. And so that's got that fairly well cleaned off uh, so that I don't, won't have a lot of sanding. What I found with this is that you can use a um, sander on this because eventually you're going to round over these, you're going to square off these edges anyway, so it's not going to be too much of a problem if you sand on it. Uh, what I found is that when you do sand on this, you can't have the sander uh, up like this, it'll grab it. So you want it fairly well closed and you can get all the way out to the edges with no problem at all. Uh, I'm not going to bother sanding this because uh, it's just a demo piece, but uh, uh, it, works, it works fairly well um, to sand like that. The front part, I do have to sand it, and we'll talk more about that later. So, once you get all this sanded, the next thing that we need to do is find the center of one of these pieces. Like I said, this is about 7 inches, so half of it's going to be 3 and a half. And I brought a little square with me to find the center and mark a line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here, so I'm going to leave about, about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to make a mark on both sides. Now, what I've done is I've made some patterns. Uh, basically what we're going to be doing is cutting a radius into this cut a radius into this, so what I did is I uh, drew an arc, and I think the arc, if I remember right, was four, 14 and 3 eighths inches in, uh, uh, as far as the radius goes. And then I cut it out with a, um, with a utility knife, so I've got a, an arc, because we're going to need both parts of this. So what I'm going to do with this, I've got a center line on this, and I'm going to line up the two ends on my corners, like that, with my center line and I'm going to mark it. This will just give me a, a reference point to shoot to, so I'm going to get rid of basically all this section in through here. Everybody clear on that one? Okay. Oh, next thing we've got to do is turn this over. This is a really nice uh, screw center, if anybody's looking for one. They're rather pricey, but they're, they're really nice. It's made by uh, Glaser High Tech. Um, Jerry Glazer used to be an old time uh, wood turner. He developed a lot of innovative things that a lot of us are still using today. And that uh, screw chuck is one of the ones that, that he um, invented, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word. Um, it comes with a wider uh, plate that goes on it so you can get more surface area on it. And it's a really well made, well -made tool. Okay, this is a four jawed chuck that I'm going to put on here next. Like I said, I've got adapters for mine so that I can work on different lathes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in here 
And what I like to do is push from the center. If you have a tendency to put it on like this and hold it like this, you're going to cock it and you're going to end up not being um, square in the chuck. So I always push in the center and then tighten it up. They say you should tighten all the holes. I don't know if that makes any difference or not, but it's standard procedure, so I guess everybody does it. I'm not convinced that it makes, makes that much difference, but you never know. Now, what I've got to do next is hog out the rest of this stuff. And like I said, I drew a, uh, drilled the hole here 7 eighths of an inch deep uh, because that seems to be about the depth that uh, this arc is going to end up being. Uh, and that way I've got a reference point so when I start getting down to the bottom of that hole, um, I know it's time, about time to stop. So anyway, I'm going to go back to my bowl gouge and I'm going to start hogging this out. I really try not to move the tool rest while the lathe is running. Um, that's the old teacher part of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the center and just start scooping this out. It's not a not rocket science. Uh, but I, I can see where I put marked that line on the corner, and I can see that, so I got a pretty good idea of where I'm going to go with that. Um, but I can't actually see the line. I have to stop and look at that. So that gives me an idea about where where I need to be. I'm about uh, heavy sixteenth above it. So now I've got an idea of how much I've got to take out. Some people will actually put a piece of masking tape on their <laughs> on their um, tool rest so they know where the where the corner's at. It's a good idea if you have trouble seeing where where it's, where that uh, line is at. Everybody seems to have some apprehension about turning square. It's really not all that difficult. The lathe doesn't really know that there's a square piece of wood on here. For all it knows is that it's round. And if you <coughs> and if you have the lathe going fast enough, um, it's not a problem at all. So this is just a matter of hogging this out. I've got the bowl gouge open to about, looks like about 1, 130, and that seems to work pretty good for this. And all I'm doing is going back a little bit, each cut that I make, towards the corner, and just following that shaving down to the center. accurate, they drill a straight hole. The only thing you've got to remember is that you've got the point to take into consideration. Because you 
because you don't want to end up with a hole in the middle of your where that point was at. And that gets me about down to where I want to be as far as the center goes, taking out material to clean up the rest of it. it up quite a bit. Did it yeah, yeah. This was um, it was a lot lot smoother than the last time or when I was doing it before. All right. So we got a little bit I'm a little bit low in the in the center or high in the center. So I want to back and see if I can get through some of that tear out that was in there. Alright, that cleaned it up better than it was. Alright, now, my line that I drew on here um, gives me a pretty good idea of where I need to take off some more material. I need to start about right in through here and, and clean some of that up because I'm still not quite down to my line but I'm getting close. This reference line on here will help to keep the, the, the sides of your, your bowl parallel to each other so that you don't have a big dip or, a, or a, a, a high spot on the wings and so forth. So once I get the majority of that done, I'm going to go back to this tool and I'm going to clean this up as much as I can and hopefully get down to my line. And you can go back and forth with this. Just be careful it doesn't fall over on you. Because I would imagine you'd get a pretty good dig if it did. And basically all you have to do is just keep checking to see where you still need to take some out. Like I said, it makes some pretty fine shavings. Um, and cleans up fairly fairly well. All right. Almost got it. Got some tear out in the center that I'll have to get out. But this tool does a really nice job cleaning up that surface. As I said it's just a matter of stopping periodically and seeing where you're at. Still getting some terror right in the middle. I'm surprised. Must be some curl right there that wants to be a little obstinate. So that's got me pretty close to the line. So a little bit more right in here and we're going to call it good. That's good. Alright, this is, I'll pass this around so you can get an idea of what that one was. So, at this point, we need to sand this. Um, this is a Milwaukee drill, uh, close quarters, right angle drill. Um, it's a really, really nice drill. Sue makes another one, but unfortunately they're out of, um, out of uh, uh, manufacture. They don't make them anymore. So what you've got to buy now are the... Um, cheap $50 Chinese ones that uh, last about a year and then you throw them away. Unfortunately, you can't even get repair, repair parts for the Sioux and the Milwaukee drills. I've got three of them and uh, I've sent them into a couple different places to get fixed and nobody seems to want to monkey with them anymore. So um, I'm just holding on to them and hoping that uh, someday somebody will get smart and, and uh, start remaking them. The Sioux is basically a Milwaukee drill. They've got the same parts and everything for them. All right, these are the... Uh, the power lock um, disc that I'm using, um, it's got a, a little hexagon, I guess, in the middle of it. 
for lack of a better term, uh, and there's little bars that stick out, and then they fit into a recess in the, in the drill. And what I like about them is they go on and off quick. You just push them in and turn them, and they're locked into place, and they're real easy. Now, sanding this edge here, uh, this front here, is something that we have to do because um, the next application that we have on here requires a smooth surface. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn down the speed. I like to do this at somewhere around 500. Um, that looks about right. And it's just a matter of three flat. If you kick it up too far, it's going to... Boy, there was a lot of bumps in that one. If you, if you tip it up too far this way and you go over those corners, you're going to have problems. All right, I'm going to call that done just simply because I don't want to sand. Uh, what I do next is I always sand these edges. Uh, and basically, I just take my sandpaper and keep it, or my sander and keep it flat and go along this edge. So I get the marks and stuff out of it. Uh, it works pretty good. The hardest part is doing the end grain, obviously, because there's tear out when you, when you cut it. Um, but that's something you're just going to have to deal with. All right. Simply because I don't want to make a big dusty mess, uh, we'll call that done, even though it's far from being done. I found that these um, uh, Microsoft microfiber claws work pretty good for getting the dust off. This is actually a, a tack rag that I bought from the paint store, and it does a pretty decent job uh, getting rid of all the, the dust and so forth that, that's on there something you want to clean off before you start doing the next step. Next thing I'm going to do is paint this. This is just a cheap foam brush that I bought from the paint store. Uh, this is some stuff called gesso. Uh, it's what artists use for canvases, uh, making them black, all completely black or white. Uh, it's G-E-S-S-O. It's a water-based material. I just use a little plastic container. Put some in it, and then with the with the foam brush, I'm just going to start painting it on here, going with the grain. It's a real nice opaque material. And it flattens out fairly well. When you're doing this, you want to brush towards an edge. You never want to brush away from any of the edges because then you'll get slop over on the sides. And it dries fairly quickly. A dot glob of about a quarter size, size of a quarter, seems to work well for this. Make sure things get covered entirely because you don't want any stray dots around anywhere. Uh, this is more of a bigger problem today because it's not quite as smooth as it should be. So, all right, now we've got to do is wait for this thing to dry. So in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for it to dry, all right, the next thing that we need to do is make a, a jig of sorts. And I'm not going to bother making one of these things today because uh, one thing I forgot to do on that is check to see my arc but this will work all right. Anyway, what you're doing with this is you're making an arc in this base that's going to follow the arc that was turned in there. I didn't check it, so we might have a problem with that. Uh, I got in a little bit of a hurry. Um, but this is basically what you're doing, is you're making a um, pattern here so that one is uh, equal to the other one, so that hopefully that piece there will go over top of this and mesh with this so that we can turn off the bottom and do the offsets and things that, that we need to do um, on the bottom. So, uh, I made one out of, a smaller one out of MDF, uh, and I was going to bring a piece of MDF with me, but I hate the smell of the stuff, and uh, it's dirty and nasty and dusty and stuff, so I just figured that what I would do is just um, make one up and, and just say basically, just start turning it. All you're basically doing is cutting off the corner and making an arc. And like I said, the, the pattern that you're, that you're using is going to match this so that um, 
the two pieces will go together and mesh okay. The stuff that's on here is that piece of, um, what do they call it? Um, it's that tacky back foam that you can get from Michaels or any Hobby Lobby or any of those things. Uh, it's sticky on the back. I, the first one I did with this one, I used just one piece because I'm cheap and I found out it doesn't really work all that well. Um, the second one that I made, this larger one, I used two pieces and it still doesn't stick real well even though I sanded this, this dome and uh, put a finish on it so it was fairly, fairly um, um, closed grain. Uh, I ended up having to staple this with a uh, staple gun to um, um, make sure the foam didn't come off. On this one, what I did is I used a, a chuck, made a tenon, put a chuck in there, and I always mark where the uh, jaws were at just so that I can make sure I get it back in the same position. But this is basically what, what you need to do to do the back. I put a finish on it. I just sprayed it with deft. Uh, just so that I didn't have the problems with dust and things like that. And then I just lightly steel wooled it off so that there was a, um, so that surface was sealed. So, anybody else have any questions while we're waiting for that stuff to dry? What I did next is I marked the numbers on my, from the jaw on the back of my, um, my piece of wood. So number two is number two, number one and so forth. This is so that I can get um, the offset so I'm not using one more than once. So I'm going to start with number one, and all I'm going to do is open up the jaw, and that line that I drew on there earlier when we first started it halfway in the middle, I'm just going to offset the bowl back to that line and tighten it back up. It's just straight. I didn't on these on this small stuff. I don't bother with the dovetail. I've never seemed to have a problem. Larger things that uh, that I need more more substantial holding, I do that with. But these ones, I just leave it leave it straight. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a skew, set it on its edge, and I'm just going to use the point to offset it. Now I've tried a um, a different skew. It didn't work real well. I had some tear out on it. I tried a spear point tool, I had a little bit of tear out on that, and I'm hoping that this uh, really, really sharp uh, skew is going to um, not give me any problems. So I want to turn this up. And what I found yesterday when I was doing this is when you're looking at this, you can see the solid center on this. Out here where the uh, square corners are at, uh, you're going to see a ghost line. You want to make these marks on the solid part. I didn't do that yesterday, and I ended up throwing a really nice piece away. Uh, so when, when winter comes, I'll have a nice little ceremony when I throw it in the wood stove. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this up on its corner and be far enough back so that you can rest the tool entirely on the tool rest. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make, using the corner, just going to make a little mark. And what that does is it just offsets it just a little bit. And I found that two work seemed to work better, so I'm going to put another one right here. And you want the, you want the marks about the same depth. Um, so basically that's what we're going to do. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten this back up. Put it back where it was. I started with number one, so now I'm going to go over to number two. Offset that to the line. Tighten that up. And then I'm going to go more towards the inside. Now you can quit at one. Or you can keep going around the, around the project. So now I'm at two. Now I want to go over to three. I when I when I made the tenon, um, the tenon is about a quarter of an inch long. I put a line in the center or an eighth of an inch away, so I'm offsetting at about an eighth of an inch. And I'm just going to keep going. toward the center until I start running out of 
marks. Like I said, you can just do one, you can do two, you can do whatever you want. Um, so that's basically all there is to making the offsets. Now, anybody have any questions on that? Any questions up to this point? On the piece that I passed around, uh, I don't even know where it's at anymore, uh, I made a, okay, made a series of dots on here. And what I did with that is I just used a Dremel tool with a uh, flexible shaft on it. And I don't know if you can get in on that or not, see what that is. I've got one I can pass around if we can't see this. That's just a ball, just a small ball. I'd like to have a little bit bigger one, but I couldn't find one, so I was stuck with that one because I just went to the hardware store and obviously they don't have them always, or everything that, that you want. Oops. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Craft Supplies or the sister store next door would probably have them too. Uh, Trendline or whatever they call it. With this, it's just a matter of deciding where you want the want the marks to go. And it's just a matter of putting them in there. Just like that. It's really simple. Uh, you can put as many as you want, as few as you want. Uh, and then to get the color in there, I just used some Sharpie markers. I wanted to get some of the Prismacolor ones, but I didn't, pay, I didn't feel like paying uh, like $60 for a whole set of them when I just wanted it for a demo. Um, they didn't have them individually. They were just selling them the sets where I was at. So I bought the Sharpie markers. I don't know if they're gonna, if they're gonna hold up or not, but as far as being light safe or whatever, but it does the job. So it's just a matter of painting the colors in there. You can also go back and paint the uh, offsets if you want to do that. Um, it's not necessary. It's not even necessary to, to put any color in there, but I thought that that might be uh, a nice touch for them. So, anybody have any questions about about the offsets or the... I, the, the mark that I put in there at the beginning on my foot, I made a line in the center because my, my foot was about a quarter of an inch. So I've made a mark about an eighth of an inch or in the center of that thing. Then what I did is I marked my um, jaws so I didn't get mixed up. And all I did is took the, the key, took that plate and offset it so the front of the jaw was on that line. And that just offset it enough and so I could get the marks that I want in there. When I'm, when I'm all done, um, I put the lacquer on. So we'll get to that in a bit. All right. I forgot to check when I, um, when I was done here because I didn't want to, I just got in a hurry. Anyway, by having that line that I had on there, I came down to where it was pretty good. So I'm, I'm really close to where I need to be as far as the arc goes. So you want to get down there so that the arc that you made on this piece of cardboard follows the arc on your wood, okay? And that'll, that'll make sure that uh, the two pieces will mesh. Any questions on that? If I were gonna do a bunch of these, I would probably make this, uh, this pattern out of um, um, masonite or, or a piece of plexiglass or something like that. A lot of the patterns that I use regularly uh, in the shop, I make them out of plexiglass. And what I like about the plexiglass is that you can put the, the, the pattern down on your wood and you can see through it and adjust it so that you get to take advantage of the best grain that you've got on, on, your, um, on your wood, especially if you've got, if you've got a little, little bit of leeway. This is probably going to get banged up and um, um, broken at, at some point, but like I said, it was, I think it was a 14 and 3 eighths radius that I used uh, when I drew all this stuff out. So, everything's dry. Um, I've got my, uh, my grooves in there. 
Uh, you can put the uh, little dots in there after you take it off the lathe. You don't have to do it right now. I just did it for expediency purposes. So I'm going to take this off. And now I'm going to start working on the back. And like I said, I mark where the jaws were at when I did it so I can get them back in the same spot. I don't know if it makes any difference or not, but it makes me feel better. So, I'm good there. Now, when we started out, I said that it was very, very important to find that center because what we're going to do now is put this center here into this center and bring this up to our chuck. And lock it into place. Now what that does is gives me a surface that I can start working on the base. It doesn't match perfectly, but it, uh, the one that I was working on yesterday was even worse than this and it didn't, I didn't have any problems at all with it. So Now obviously when you squeeze this uh, tenon here with your chuck jaws, it's going to leave a mark in it. And what we have to do is, is take that mark out. So what I found is that a spindle gouge seems to work fairly well for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this We're off a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem. And you want to get rid of all those indented marks. I wouldn't get too carried away with taking off too much, but make sure that you take off enough to get rid of the marks. Because what I found is that if they're not entirely gone, they have a tendency to swell once you put the, put the finish on it, and then you, they come back. So, now, that, that's fairly smooth now, that's good enough. Uh, now the, the question is, what kind of a shape are you going to put on your foot? Uh, you could put a, a dovetail in there, you could put a bead in there, uh, you could put a cove in there. Uh, there's any number of things slanted to, towards the center. Uh, I usually just take and put a little cove in there. Just for something different. Um, like I said, you can do whatever you want. Um, the next thing is, what are you going to do with that edge? And like I said, we got rid of that a little bit in there uh, with, the, with that parting tool that I put. Um, we can get in here with a skew and clean up that edge a little bit, like this. Or we can put some texture in there. So what I've got is a skew that is really, really curved. Um, uh, I forget what, what class I was in that had this. I think this is one of Ray Key's tools that, that we used um, for this. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come up here right to the corner and I'm going to plunge it in there and just make a mark. What that's going to be is a line to differentiate where the texture is going to be. And the texturing tool that I'm going to use, one that I bought from Eli Avicero when I was down in Texas with the class for him, it's just a homemade tool. Uh, it's a slot that was cut into a, a piece of metal and then this, I don't know what, what that thing is that he used. Sorby has one just like this. They're miniature turning tools that you can use. The only problem that I can see with it, I've got one of them and I haven't played with it because I've got this one and I bought another one from Ellie. Uh, the points seem to be too sharp on it. And it looks to me like it's going to really dig into the wood. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, there's a little brass bolt in there on, on the Sorby one. I'm going to take that bolt out and I'm going to put this on the lathe and just hit this with some sandpaper just to knock those points off on the Sorby one. But they'll work basically the same way. 
So all I'm going to do is bring this back a little bit so I've got some room to work because I want the shaft of this to be on the, on the tool rest. Um, I got this idea from a guy down in New Zealand by the name of Terry Scott. Uh, he does some really, really outstanding work. For those of you who are on the World of Woodturner site, he has, he's had posted some wood and work in there occasionally, and he does some really, really nice work. I, um, I got an opportunity to spend some time with him. Uh, like I said, I missed my travel budget for the magazine. I, I um, went on that Norwegian wood turning cruise six or seven years ago, and it was a fantastic experience, and Terry was one of the demonstrators on there, so I got, got a chance to talk with him. Um, when he puts this, this texturing on here, he calls it his $10 tool because every time it touches the work wood, the price goes up $10. And it really does make a difference. Uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the speed down. Again, four to 600. Put this on here, I'm going to get it in the corner, and I'm just going to make an arc. And you can see how it does that. And what it does is it camouflages that corner. So if you don't have it sanded all that well, nobody's going to know it. Um, that didn't really do as much as I'd like it to do, so we'll try it again. Could be that this is getting really dull, or I didn't press hard enough. That's better. All right, so it'll make, it'll make the marks in there. Then I found what we need to do is take a brass brush and just tickle it a little bit. We don't want to get crazy with it, but just tickle it to get through the, the fuzzies, and that takes care of it. Now, to highlight that, I'm going to go back to this tool, and I'm going to make a mark right on the edge. Make sure your tool is flat or it'll skate on you. Sometimes it skates on its own. And we'll make a mark. And I'm going to turn it off to make sure I hit the edge of it. Good. And then I'm going to make two more marks. Because things are better in threes. And it just gives me two more opportunities to screw up. So what that does is it just provides a little bit of decoration on the bottom of the... Uh, bottom of the bowl. Okay? Any questions up to that point? All right, all we have left to do is take off this area in the foot. Uh, all of you know, any of you that are experienced turners know that a, a bowl sits better on a ring than it does on a flat surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undercut that foot. And I've got a little small eighth inch gouge that I've used for years just basically for this, for this operation. Um, take my spindle gouge and make sure that's flat. And all I'm doing is scraping that a little bit just to make sure that, that it's flat. And then I'm just going to undercut this. Now I've used that texturing tool inside on the foot too here as well, especially if I've got a, a bigger area. It seems to add a little bit of interest to that. Now, to get rid of that centerpiece, what we're going to do is use some blue tape. That's why when I get done using tape, I always fold the end of it over. Like this. That way when I go to find it, next time I don't have to fight with it. Alright, what we're going to do is just to so you can get rid of that tail stock. I'm going to go, go around this and just tape the corners. That's why it was important to at least get the, the two pieces so that they were at least close to um, having the same shape. Um, so that we can I thought this was a really good idea for uh, getting this bottom and we don't have very much to take off basically all we're going to do is 
get rid of that center nub. Now at home when I do this, on other bowls that, are, that I use a jam chuck, uh, I go around the outside edge and tape that down, but we're not going to be doing all that much with this, so I'm not going to worry about it at this point. So, I can remove this. Get my tool rest adjusted. And then I'm just going to very carefully take that little nub off. Now, like I said, at this point, uh, you can sand all this. Like I said, I, um, um, sometimes I put some texturing in there. What I always do is take that little skew and I make two lines in there. So I've got some place to put my name. And then what I usually also do is put a little shadow line right there where the ring starts. Now one thing I was, that you can do, um, there's going to be some hand sanding involved with this. And this is a tool that I got from um, Bruce Hoover at the Sanding Glove. It's a Velcro pad so I can use my sanding discs. And it really does a good job uh, when you're sanding these edges. You can get this pretty well sanded up to those corners and you, it, you'll always want to find some little marks right on the edges of that. And this pad will allow you to sand those. Um, real well. Like I said, it's Velcro on both ends. It's got a smaller end and a bigger end. They take the Velcro pads and um, uh, it's really a good way to hold the sandpaper while you're, while you're doing, the, doing the corners. Uh, as far as finishing goes, my standard finishing regimen is I put a coat of Danish oil on it uh, simply because I like the way it pops the grain and um, uh, what I like about it is if, if there are any defect, defects left in the, in the wood, a piece of scratches or or something that you didn't get out, you can go back and sand it with this without any problem. Once you get it all out, you can go back and put another coat of this on there. And it's just like you didn't, never did anything to it. Once this dry, I let this dry overnight, and then I usually spray um, rattle can deft on, on over top of the gesso and the, and the colored uh, pens, and also on the bottom. Normally what I do is I spray on two coats, <laughs> rub it down with steel wool, four out steel wool, and then put a couple more coats on it and rub it down. Uh, with the gesso, you've got to be careful that you don't rub too hard and cut through the lacquer and into the, um, into the black paint so that the, um, the wood shows underneath because you'll never be able to go back and fix it. Um, once I get that dry, I've got the steel wool down for the last time, I always go back and put another coat of the Danish oil on it. And what I like about that is that it gets rid of all that white dust that the... Um, uh, steel wool makes when you, when you steel wool off the deft. Okay? I like the satin deft uh, that comes in a semi-gloss, a satin, and a gloss. The gloss and the semi-gloss, semi I start having problems with seeing uh, orange peel on it. I don't know if it was me or the product or whatever, but I didn't like it. And I really don't like the shine either. So I started using the, uh, the, the satin and I haven't had any problems at all. So that's basically how I finish just about everything. Do you ever use wood sandpaper instead of steel wool? On the, on, the, um, on the deft, I usually don't because it's soft enough that the steel wool will cut it. If I'm doing polyurethane or something like that, yeah, I use sandpaper because the, the steel wool won't touch it. Not like I like it anyway. But with the deft, I find it soft enough that, that I haven't, I've been happy with the steel wool. Thank you.